Hello, and welcome to the Ross Around Backstage Podcast. Talking with artists, technicians, musicians, producers, directors, and all the interesting and talented people that make it all happen for you. Hi, everybody. This is Ross Pallone with the Ross Around Backstage Podcast, and I'm here today in Thousand Oaks, my home studio, with film director, producer, screenwriter, J.T. Molner. J.T. has recently had uh, a feature film called Outlaws and Angels. It was uh, it premiered at the Sundance 2016 Festival. Uh, J.T. also has a, a series of short films that he's done, Flowers in December, John the Little Bug, Sugar Town, and Red Room. So my first question for you, J.T., is uh, how did you get into this business? Uh, thank you for having me, Ross. I appreciate being here. It's been an interesting road and trajectory to uh, the place I, I am now. I'm finally, you know, actually making a living doing what I love to do. And, uh, and I, did, I did make um, a feature film that came out. And, and now I do, a lot of, I do a lot of writing as well to pay the bills in between films. And I'm doing my new film soon. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a long, interesting road because I started off when I was a really young child. I started reading um, I started reading novels that were written for adults at a, at a really young age. I think I, I, it took me months to read it, but I think I read Stephen King's Carrie when I was five. And, uh, and, and I, I made it through, and I really wanted to be a, um, a novelist when I was really young. So I started writing short stories. I was very into film and watching movies and and the visuals of film, but most importantly, I was into storytelling. And I just, uh, you know, I started writing short stories when I was very young, and I attempted writing a novel when I was a young kid as well. But I think that even though I thought I wanted to be a novelist all this time, um, the the film bug was gestating in me. And my 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 older brother. Uh, there were a number of people in my life who sort of made me a cinephile and made me want to uh, – and, and, and led to my decision to become a filmmaker late in life. Uh, one of them was my brother, Daniel Molnar, who was a student at CalArts um, Film School. He went to UCLA and then he went to CalArts Film School when I was a kid. He turned me on to a lot of sort of um, art house films and uh, interesting movies that uh, – you know, as a as a kid under ten, I wasn't being exposed to in the mainstream. Um, you know, we were going to the movies and watching Star Wars and Indiana Jones, but my brother was showing me a racer head. You know, so I was uh, I was really exposed to a lot of uh, sort of a, a different a different type of film through him. A racer head, movies like A Racer Head and Choose Me, and 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 just interesting movies uh, that I probably wasn't supposed to be watching at that age, but but he'd show me and. Uh, it's interesting because my my brother was going to film school, so I instantly thought that I uh, needed to not be a filmmaker, even though films were becoming so important to me um, as a child. I thought that since my brother had chosen the path of being a filmmaker, that I couldn't. I had to do my own thing and blaze my own trail. So I stuck with this idea that I was going to be um, that I was going to be a writer and uh, a novelist. But I still got more and more into film. The other couple people in my life who, who influenced me and got me really um, excited about cinema were uh, my grandfather watched westerns constantly and I would I would go to his house and and I and we watch westerns together and I watched everything from John Ford to Sam Peckinpah um I, I even now you know westerns are sort of a comfort food for me but I I, I, I when I'm in the mood for one I try and find some uh, something I haven't seen and it's really really tough um my aunt uh Deanna Molnar was living in California I was I grew up in Vegas uh, and she was living in Los Angeles, and I would come out here to visit family each summer. And my aunt was running around before I was born with with Roman Polanski and Jack Nicholson. She was on a show called Hollywood A Go Go. She was a dancer on a show called Hollywood A Go Go in Hollywood back then, and she had been turned on to all this European cinema, Fellini's films and Igmar Bergman's films and uh, you know, Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast and all this really sort of avant-garde, The Bicycle Thief, all this really great 
influential European cinema of the 60s and the 70s. And so when I was really, really young and I would come out to visit here, she would show me uh, these films, these crazy movies by Polanski and Bergman and, and the more mainstream stuff by, or, you know, by Kubrick. Um, but I just got turned on to European cinema at a, at a really young age and started getting this taste for the avant-garde and for the dark and for the experimental. And I realized that that provocative type of artwork, that provocative type of cinema was what um, turned me on. I had a really well-balanced and <clears throat> happy childhood. My parents both came from show business. Uh, my mom was a singer, and my dad uh, was uh, was an actor. And then he turned uh, jazz dancer, and they both met in a show called the Casino de Paris in Vegas. Um, and that's how I ended up growing up in Vegas. Um, so I came from a show business family that was very, very supportive, and I was always very happy. But I, got, I started becoming obsessed with films and, and books that were about the dark side. And, and I feel like my tastes in, in novels and, and short stories and cinema were very parallel throughout my teens. I was always into thought-provoking and kind of edgy stuff. Um, I was reading Bukowski and uh, Henry Miller and, and Jack Kerouac and Hunter S. Thompson. And, and all the directors I was watching were guys like Robert Altman and Polanski and Kubrick and Truffaut and the French New Wave. And so everything I was into was, was sort of, uh, were sort of the outliers and, and the outlaw filmmakers and writers. And I think, uh, it just always was what I, I was interested in doing, uh, provoking an audience. As I got older and, and still was sort of on this path of being a novelist. Uh, that's what I wanted to be. I got out of college and moved to San Francisco. I wanted to be Jack Kerouac. And I went straight to City Lights Bookstore, you know, met other writers in San Francisco and started working on my first novel, all the while still being very obsessed with cinema. And I wrote a novel that I'm not sure was if it was very good. Uh, <laughs> I did my best to... Uh, to get it published. And then I started thinking in my mid twenties that if I wanted to be impactful and, and relevant and have an effect on people and have people actually experience my storytelling, I started realizing that I didn't see many Henry Miller's or John Steinbeck's or Ernest Hemingway's or Jack Kerouac's in the future. Uh, although I am a voracious reader and will continue to read all the time. And I will Maybe I'll write a novel down the road. But I just started seeing less people reading novels, and I wanted to reach people. And I also realized that every time I wrote a book, I was sort of jealous that I never got to bring it to life vis visually. So I made a decision to go into the film industry, leave San Francisco, and, and move back to Las Vegas when I was in my mid-20s, I was going to go and stay with my parents and save up a little money and then move to Los Angeles, California. I remember remember watching uh, the Academy Awards, and I think it was, God, it must have been 2001 or 2002. Polanski won for The Pianist, I think. He won Best Director. Uh, Sean Penn, I think, won Best Actor for Mystic River. It was, a, it was a special year for film, and I remember watching the Academy Awards that year from my dumpy apartment in San Francisco as a struggling novelist and and thinking, I really want to be a part of that. I really want to be in the film industry. And, and it, it sort of came to me that I'd always wanted to be in the film industry. And ever since I'd, you know, visit family in LA when I was a little kid, it was my dream to, to live in LA. And it was my dream to be part of this uh, amazing industry and make films. And I'd been in denial about it for so long because my brother had chosen that path before me. And uh, it wasn't until I lost that insecurity and realized, you know, it, a legacy in a family is great. Like, I, uh, there's no reason to do the opposite of what somebody else in my family is doing. So, uh, so I decided to make the move to L.A., but I knew that I had to prepare. So I went back to Vegas. This was in the early 2000s, and luckily my parents took me in for a couple years. And we all sort of agreed... I, got, I, I did a number of horrendous jobs. I, I drove a truck for Sparklets uh, for a little while, and that was the most physically taxing and most miserable job I've probably ever done. It was, uh, 
<laughs> God, it was 12. I mean, it was, you know, I'd get to you work at five. doing that. Too, I did. You? I did. I got, I got injuries. I did it for almost a year and I would get there at five in the morning. We'd have to load the truck up and then we'd have to run five gallon water bottles, you know, through a route all day and I'd run up and down steps with them one at a time. And we wouldn't get done till the route was finished. So I would get home exhausted at, you know, sometimes 10 p.m. after getting up at five and then I have to go to sleep oh, and do it all over again. Horrible. I mean, it was it was definitely the hardest job I've ever done. And I did that for a little while. And then I sort of Those found, kind of jobs, though, will teach you that you better figure out something else to do. You right? better figure out something else. Or you're going to be stuck doing that forever. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, there were guys, I mean, it's a really, it's an honest living and, and, and sparklet, wa- sparklet water drivers, I have the utmost respect for because they make a good, but they make a lot of money. I mean, there were, there were guys there who'd been doing it for 30 years who were in their fifties and sixties and, and, uh, and, and this was their career. And I thought maybe I could be, um, a guy who could do a career like that. But I realized quite quickly that I was a weakling who couldn't handle it. (laughs) (laughs) But you weren't really a weakling though, because you've always, I know that you've always worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I was, you know, I was in, I was in, I was in shape to do it, but I, I don't know if I had the resolve. I mean, I really have, like I said, I have a great respect for people who can do that sort of manual labor all day long and do it every day and do it for a number of years. I mean, Maybe I could still be doing it, but I definitely knew I didn't want to keep doing it because yeah. I was I was just I was just a, a wreck all the time. And I'd get to the weekend after five days at Sparklets, I finally had some money in my pocket and money in the bank. That was exciting because they they pay well. I would get home for the weekend excited about having money in the bank that I could actually spend, and I'd sleep for the entire weekend. Um, so, <laughs> so that's not so, fun. No, no, no. So I, I, I never had any time to spend the money, but it was good because I was saving money. So I worked at Sparklets, and I put a bunch of money away. And th- this is in Vegas, right? This is in Vegas. Where it's like 130 2000s. degrees outside in the summertime. Yes, exactly. Mm. It probably would have been easier in, in Northern California or something yeah. um, with the weather. But it was, you know, we were doing this in... 115, 120 degree heat. So yeah. like I said, nothing against anybody who drives a water truck. Uh, I actually have a great respect for them now because I did it. And it was it's what I'll always remember. And I've done so many crazy jobs because if you're gonna if you're gonna have a career in the arts and you wanna finally be able to find a way to make a living doing what you love, I think you have to always find a way to earn while you're doing that. And you know, I know people who don't find ways to earn or expect other people to, to, you know, step in and help them. But the thing is, when you choose a life um, in the arts, uh, it's sort of your responsibility to make sure uh, you create the path to get there. And I always knew during all those years that even though I wanted to be a, a writer who was paid to write, and I ended up wanting to be a filmmaker, I knew that, you know, while I was pursuing that, there had to be a way to to pay rent. So I, I probably, I mean, I, and I would always have to get jobs and then quit them because I, I would get a gig at some point. So I look back at all the jobs I've had and I probably had 50 different jobs at restaurants and bars and it was mostly bartending and waiting tables. Those were the easiest things to do for short amounts of time and, and get quickly. But, but I did do sparklets for a long time. So I was doing that. It really inspired me and, and stimulated my, my desire to, to stop doing it. And in, in Las Vegas, there were a lot of places hiring actors at the time. There was a, there was a show called the Star Trek experience that was at, uh, at the Hilton hotel, which is now, I think it's a different place now, but there was a show called the Star Trek experience that was paying a living wage with benefits. Uh, if you got hired to act in that show as one of the Starfleet commanders and, uh, and there was a show called Tony and Tina's wedding, uh, which was on, on the strip that was hiring Italians and I'm half Italian. So I thought maybe I could fit the bill for that. So I discussed with my parents and we sort of thought that in order to get into the film business, Acting may be the best way to get my foot in the door and at least learn the business, but do some plays, do some, because even if I was going to end up directing, it would be, it would certainly be nice to know what it was like um, on the other side of the camera. And so, uh, and I always loved performing and came from a show business family. So I thought it would be um, 
really interesting, and, and I thought I might be I might be good at it. So I went out for um, an audition at the Hilton Hotel for the show, the Star Trek Experience. It was <laughs> it was very competitive, actually. It's it's sort of a, it's funny. Uh, uh, saying it now, but uh, it was it was competitive. It was one of the few paid acting jobs in town, so everybody wanted it. So I went out and auditioned for that. I ended up getting cast as Starfleet Commander Ross wow. in the uh, in the Borg Invasion show at the Star Trek Experience, uh, and that was that was exciting because I knew even though I wasn't sure if I wanted you know to be a famous actor or if acting was going to be my life, I was very very excited not to have to work at a restaurant not to have to deliver sparklets water bottles uh, and to be able to be in an air-conditioned theater performing uh, five days a week and getting paid for it. So that was my first professional job in the industry. Wow. I was working at the, the Star Trek experience at the, at the Hilton Hotel in Vegas. And it was a lot of fun. And while I was there, they opened up auditions for Tony and Tina's wedding, which was more of a sort of a legitimate show. You know, the Star Trek experience was was funny. It was kind of like a, 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 a like a, an amusement park show or a, a combination between a show and a ride. You know, it was more of a, a Universal Studios type. I don't know. Yeah, it was it was more it was a blend between an amusement park and a show. But the 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 Tony and Tina's wedding show was an actual off-Broadway production that had come to Vegas and was very very successful. I knew that being in that show would give me experience, like real stage experience as an actor. And so I, um, I went and auditioned for, for Tony and Tina's wedding, and I didn't hear anything from them at first. I didn't know what role I was going to get. I just sort of wanted anything. They had me reading for The Best Man, Barry. They had me reading some stuff for Tony, but I knew they had a really good Tony, uh, the, the lead in the show. I knew they had a good one already. And so I wasn't sure what I was going to get there. So I, I left that audition and I went and decided to do a play at Las Vegas Little Theater called What the Butler Saw. And I got that role as well. And I ended up in that play. And while I was in that play, I got a call a few weeks later from Tony and Tina's wedding. And they told me that the Tony who was in the show, the lead in the show, was sort of aging out of the role a little bit. He was still a really young guy. He was in his 30s, but Tony was supposed to be sort of fresh out of college. So he was going to move into another role, and they were looking for their lead, and they wanted to cast me. So it was it was incredibly exciting. Uh, I got cast as the lead in, in Tony and Tina's Wedding, uh, and I did that show for about two years, and I did some little theater in thing. Vegas. It was, it was, yeah, it was, it was five nights a week. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had, you know, I would have a, an understudy who would do it a couple nights. When I first started, there was, there were always, you know, two or three leads, two or three Tonys, and two or three Tinas, and there was one who would do it more days than the others. And that was a very, very special experience because I met. That was the first time I was. That and my little theater experience at, at Las Vegas Little Theater were both really special because they were the first time – it was the first time that I'd ever had an interaction with um, serious actors who loved what they did and and had aspirations to do more and, and to do it professionally. And these people were all much more experienced than I was. They'd been interested in acting since they were – you know. Uh, small children. So I learned a lot from the people that I worked around. This is when I, I sort of decided to move to Los, to Los Angeles. Uh, I'd been in the show for a little while and it was getting comfortable. You know, I was doing uh, the Star Trek show in the daytime, Tony and Tina's wedding at night. And then I was doing little theater on the side. I was acting all the time and I was getting paid for it. And so I knew that if I stayed in Vegas, it was it was kind of comfortable. I mean, I wasn't making tons of money, but I was making enough to pay my rent and to survive and to have a little extra in the bank. And I was really comfortable. And I thought, all of a sudden, I didn't want to leave Vegas because I was. I knew if I came to L.A., I probably would have to go right back to, you know, slinging water or hamburgers, like yeah, <laughs> whatever. Right, yeah. So, so I I was I was a little scared of the move to L.A. The guy who, who used to be the lead of Tony and Tina's Wedding, who I um, took the role after he left the role, his name was John Lombardo, and he's still one of my best friends. He ended up playing a role in, in, my, new, in my feature film, Outlaws and Angels. He got, he got knocked out by Luke Wilson in one of our scenes. Uh, but he's, he's an old friend of mine now, but at the time he was a new friend, and he really believed in me. And he was a few years older than me, so he, he was sort of a mentor. And 
he said, uh, he said, you have a lot of talent. I believe in you. Uh, you've got to get to LA and you got to get to LA before you're 30. You know, he, he just, he, he really stressed the importance of starting young because there are a lot of people in LA who have careers in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, but all those people started, um, when they were very, very young and they paid their dues for a long time and it takes a long time. So he said, you got to move to LA. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know if I can afford it yet. You know, it's going to be expensive there and I want to get some savings put away. And so this wonderful man, uh, this angel, John said to me, um, uh, and his wife, Della Lombardo was, was also really integral in this. They both said to me, uh, we believe in you and, and dump your apartment, come live for free in our home. They had an extra bedroom uh, with our family, stay here and save money for a few months so you can move to LA. So I moved in with them and lived there for free as part of the deal. I still wasn't quite putting away enough to get to, to get to LA. I was nervous. And then my agent there at the time in Vegas got me an audition for a national Coors Light commercial. And I went in for that audition and I got it. And I was going to make something obscene to me at the time, more money than I'd ever seen. It was like, you know, $8,000 or something. Like it was, it was, I just, it, it changed my life. Yeah, to you, know, yeah. 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 To know at the time I, you know, I'd never been paid more than $800 at one time. And, uh, and I was getting paid, I think, you know, we were stars of a Vegas show that was a very, very successful Vegas show, but they certainly didn't pay their actors well at Tony and Tina's wedding. I, you know, I think I made a hundred bucks a performance and it was one performance a night. So it was enough to live on in Las Vegas, but it certainly wasn't $8,000. And so when I went and got that commercial, I knew that that was my money to move to LA on. I decided to move right away. So I stayed in, you know, I stayed in Vegas for a few more weeks and, and then I moved out to LA I had a friend who was living here um, in Hollywood named Evan, and he was in a totally different industry. He was in tech, but he'd, he'd gotten uh, a new job, and, and we decided to move in together. I wanted to go straight to Hollywood because I knew that was the center of everything. Yeah, of course. And, uh, and so I went straight to Hollywood and, and got a hefty dose of uh, – piss on the streets and drug dealers on my porch. And uh, <laughs> I love Hollywood, Hollywood, by the way. Yeah. I love Hollywood, by the way. I really do. Uh, but it was it was gritty. I mean, we moved right. We, we didn't really check out. We just got really excited about the place that we were renting, and we got a good deal. And uh, I won't say the exact neighborhood because I don't want to insult any neighborhood. Uh, but I, I will say that we'd never check the neighborhood out at night. And so we we moved, you know, I'm coming from uh, the outskirts of, of suburban Las Vegas. And uh, and then we move into this place in Hollywood. And at night, it just comes alive with uh, the wrong kind of nightlife. And it was it was great. It was a really cool experience because I'd never really lived in the city. And we became friends with all the street walkers who were on our street. Uh, they knew us by name and we knew them by name. And, uh, and so we, we had a bunch of... Uh, uh, sort of counterculture buddies who surrounded, uh, like I said, we lived right in the thick of it. Uh, and and our, my neighborhood in Hollywood has since been incredibly gentrified and, uh, and, and cleaned up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, I went back there and it's not anything like it was in the, in the mid aughts when I first moved out here. But, but it, was a, it was a magical experience because, you know, Evan and I were both super broke it was exactly what you imagine coming out to Hollywood for the first time. I mean, I had, uh, I went through that eight grand that seemed like a million to me very fast because rent was very expensive. I, I got a few jobs right away, like acting jobs, which is strange because acting is what, you know, most directors want to be, or like it, it's so many directors I talk to or, or producers want to be actors and they want to put themselves in their movies. Um, I was an actor who desperately wanted to be on the other side of the camera. When I came to LA, I got really lucky. I got, uh, you know, I got a couple days on a on a really cheesy soap opera called Passions, which was really exciting. It was like my first time on a real set, and it was totally it was it was incredibly funny. Um, 
I had to be a shirtless cowboy who had a number of lines, but no. uh, it's it's forever on my IMDb page, <laughs> trying yeah. to live that down ever since. But I moved to LA and I called up a bunch of agencies and I signed with a very small agency that probably, you know, they probably weren't very helpful, but it was exciting just to have some sort of representation. And that agency... Um, God, I don't even remember. I think it was called Daily Talent or something. I don't think they're around anymore. But they're the ones who who got me the Passions gig. So I got this, you know, two day job on a soap opera. And it used to be, you'd look through Backstage West, um, and you'd look through, you know, the hard copy of Variety or Hollywood Reporter. I mean, it was a couple of years after I moved to town. Everything digitized, and you know, people were reading the trades online and you could electronically submit. But when I, when I first got to town, the first like year I was here, I caught the very end of that era where you would, as an actor, you would put, you would put your headshot, like your physical headshot into a manila envelope with your resume. And you would, you know, print out 50 headshots and 50 resumes and you'd get 50 envelopes and you'd send, you'd, you'd send those envelopes out to agencies and out to casting directors. Um, now you just hit, I guess actors just hit submit. But so there was this small little period when I first got here where I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I was sort of knew I could get some acting work. And I went out to audition for a movie called The Cardinal Code, which was a feature film. And uh, it was an indie film. And uh, the director was this guy named Neto Bernard. And I, I went in for that audition and they hired me to be the second lead, and there were like five guys in the film. It was uh, sort of a uh, a crime movie, a, a twists and turns. These guys all turned against each other on a camping trip and find out secrets about each other. Uh, the movie didn't do much. I don't. I don't know if it was. I don't think it was released. It was a really great script and a uh, really cool concept, and and all the actors on it were good. And but I don't think the movie ever came out. But that movie really. Uh, jump-started my career as a film director because I got to learn a lot about the process on that film. I really thought because of the amount of films I'd watched and sort of the innate understanding I had for for filmmaking, I just thought I thought I could do it and I thought I could try it. I wanted to make some short films and, and start learning the craft of, of film directing. And uh, I met my co-star on the movie. It was a guy named Chris Ivan Sevick. He wanted to produce movies. So we met on that set and uh, and now Chris Ivan Sevic, who I met on that set back in you know 2007, has produced a commercial for me, four short films, and uh, was a producer on Outlaws and Angels, my feature film. So that was where that connection was made, um, my initial sort of creative partner, because every director and writer needs a producer who's good at putting the film together, making sure it comes in under budget, just doing all the business stuff and, and making sure and being there as a creative consultant, like everybody needs a great producer. And so Chris was was the first guy I met who said, hey, I want to produce movies. And I said, hey, I want to direct movies. And so even though that movie didn't come out and become some big success, we got off that film and started sort of plotting our careers and what we wanted to do. And I said, well, hey, I really want to make a short film and I want to learn to make movies. I, I felt like I was too old to go to film school. I was already, I was already in my late twenties and I just felt like I wanted to start doing it and learning by doing it. So uh, I had a manager uh, named Nicholas Terry at the time who I'd met through another actor friend of mine. And uh, Nick is actually, there were, there was a period where he wasn't my manager, but he's my manager again. So we've been together for, for a long, long time. But at the time, my manager and Chris Ivan Sevick and I all sat down and decided we were going to do a short film. And I wrote a film. Uh, it was called The Red Room. And it was a very provocative short film that I was really proud of. And, and I wanted to showcase, you know, what I thought I knew about filmmaking. We, I wanted to shoot on film. Kodak motion picture film. And this was during a period where a lot of young filmmakers were starting to shoot digitally on video. I was really adamant right from the beginning that I wanted to shoot on celluloid because I signed up to be a filmmaker, not a, not a file maker. I really wanted to shoot on film. It was important to me. So we, uh, at the time it was, you know, it was tough to 
to shoot a short on film because of, of budgetary constraints. And, and we looked and we realized that we, we, you know, we needed 10, 10 or 15 grand to shoot this short film. And I didn't know where we were going to get it. And we had met a couple guys who were actors who didn't have enough real, who wanted roles in things and who also happened to be independently wealthy. So Chris and I sat down and, and we thought, what if we go to one of these guys who we know, who we met in an acting class, and what, what if we say, um, will you finance this short film if we cast you as one of the leads? Mm-hmm. Um, good idea. Yeah, and you know, the guy we went to, was a, was a, he was a good actor. He could act. So we went and propositioned this guy and said, you know, would you, would you like to be... Uh, in the short film, would you like, and we didn't want him to finance the whole thing. We just wanted help. We wanted to get it started. And then we'd, we were going to go to a few family members and a few other people and just kind of piecemeal it together. But, you know, we wouldn't have cast him unless he was right for it, but he was. And uh, he also was, wanted to produce. Uh, He wanted to, to be a producer of films and an actor. So we said, well, listen, help us financially put this movie together, be in the movie and uh, and then you can be a producer on it, and you can be an actor in it. So we went out to a few other people and and who wanted to be producers, and you know gave them producer credits in exchange for a little so piece you of the budget. Pr- producers on this. On this yeah, we have film. a lot. Of, I mean, all my short films have. Yeah. Oh God! I mean, if you look at, you go on IMDb and look at any of my short films. I mean, some of them have you know, five or 10 producers, but I mean, or executive producers who are, you know, basically financing producers. But then, you know, you look at uh, my fourth short film or my third short film, which was called Sugar Town. We financed that movie solely through crowdfunding. So that movie, I think we have like 50 producers because it was, oh, if you give this amount of money, you get an executive producer credit. So oh, okay. <laughs> we have so many, I mean, it, whatever it took, to get the movie made is what yeah. we did. That's what it takes to be an entrepreneur, doesn't it? Yeah, to totally. figure it out totally. somehow. So we, you know, I, I can, I can. That's how my film career started. Uh, that's how I learned. You know, that was a team that endured. It was me and Chris Ivan Sevic, who was always my producing partner from that point forward on the the shorts. We knew we were going to go out and have to find sort of a prestigious deal making uh, creative producer for the feature at some point. We knew we wouldn't just go and make it ourselves. We would have to get another producer to partner with. Um, but Chris and I, that was pretty much my film school, making those short films for all those years. And, you know, uh, I keep, I have a very tight family of filmmakers and, and a team that we've we've compiled over the years, very loyal to the people I work with. They're very loyal to me. We, we have a very special sort of family, uh, a group that, that make films together. And a lot of people say, don't hire your friends, don't work with your friends. I totally disagree with that. I think that um, you have to, the best way to work is to work with people you're friends with and that you trust and that you love. The key is never hire friends who aren't talented. <laughs> so yeah, you, right. yeah. you can only work with friends who are good at what they do. Yeah. Um, but if you find somebody who's good at what they do and you become close with them, um, I think it's, it's, it can be a very, uh, a very you know, it can, it can flourish, uh, the relationship, because you can really trust the person you're working with. So that's the way I prefer to work. I like to work um, with the same people over and over again. Obviously, we have... People, but you know, uh, Cato, uh, Cato, Cato Banks, who's um, our music supervisor. He's also my publicist, and he's been an associate producer on a bunch of the projects and helped out in various ways on every film. He's part of our filmmaking team, and Cato always likes to say that we're a uh, we're a band. You know, and he's like, we're we're a band, and we all come together to do these shows. And JT is the lead singer, and ironically, I always tell him that uh, I'm absolutely the lead singer until we hire our lead actor. And then that person becomes the lead singer. Uh, uh, We had, I mean, Chad Michael Murray was definitely our lead singer and, and Francesca Eastwood as well on our, on our feature. But we have this group of, of this team of filmmakers. It's, you know, Chris Ivan Sevic always is my, like we're, we're equal partners on these films uh, because we do, uh, a pretty much equal amount of work and just in different ways. You know, I'll, what I'll do is I'll write uh, it, our process on the short films was I'd write a script and then Chris would be the first one to read it. 
and he'd give me, you know, feedback on the script. And I'd do another pass, and then he'd send it out to some other people, and we'd get the script to where we wanted. And then, you know, we'd go on set, and and and, and I'd tell, you know, me and Chris would figure out how much money we had to shoot the short film, and and Chris would tell me what was possible and what wasn't, and what we could do, and none of that stuff. I mean, we were just a really, really good team, and so so we built up this sort of team on the way and we work with mostly the same department heads and and we just have I have people I like to surround myself with because because we all trust each other but we you know we spent a long time making these short films uh, this was we made our first short film back in like 2007 and I kept thinking okay like we made this short film back then I thought we made this short film we got into a festival we got into Holly Shorts Film Festival we got into SoCal Film Festival we got into a couple other Holly Shorts is an amazing festival and, and now I'm on the jury there but we got into some very small festivals some other ones that were very small when you make your first short film you think this is really good and somebody's going to see this and in three months I'll be shooting the feature version of this for 10 million dollars mm-hmm. I thought something like that would happen overnight but what I like to tell every young filmmaker I ever speak to uh, who asks, how did you finally make a feature film or when did you start feeling, when did success happen or, or you know, when were you able to start earning a living doing what you're doing? Uh, for me, it didn't happen at all like I would. And I still feel like I'm in process of getting to where I want to be. Obviously, I always will be. But, but it just feels, um, for me, it was so incremental that I never felt that moment where it like happened. It was, um, it was, you know, one short film that did okay. And then another short film and then another short film. And then all of a sudden uh, I did get hired to do a, um, because of those short films, I got hired to do a commercial at one point and I got hired to do a music video. So I was making a little money as a director, but I was this entire time. I still had to, had to be a bartender. Um, I was either a waiter or a bartender throughout my first eight years of directing. And so, you know, I made all these short films and I got hired to do a few things, but I wasn't getting, and I'd written a feature film that I was shopping around town, but I just couldn't get it to catch fire. I couldn't get it made. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of our group, some of the people on our team said, you know, why don't you write something that that's a little easier to shoot that has more genre elements, uh, maybe, maybe it's horror, maybe it's violence, maybe it's this, maybe, but why don't you write something that's easier to shoot, it's more contained, and that also has genre elements, um, and maybe it'll get, it'll get made easier. I was shopping around this very dramatic, this really dark drama that was sort of leaving Las Vegas meets Tender Mercies or something, and it, and it just wasn't the type of movie that was easily financed first, so... So I decided that I would write a Western, and uh, which was a really bad idea, by the way, because you don't want to write a period piece to make for a low budget as your first movie. Uh, but I thought that if I wrote a Western, but it was, it was contained and very much inspired by the early, very tight Polanski films like Knife in the Water and Repulsion and Cul-de-Sac, like all these movies that Polanski made in the early part of his career were um, were very contained movies. So they were always three or four characters in one location. And they felt claustrophobic and they increased the the, the setting and the, the claustrophobic elements increased the tension. And they sort of helped the story along. So I thought I'm going to write one of those claustrophobic movies. And it's going to help the budget, but it's also going to help the story. It's going to serve the purpose of what I want to do creatively. Um, And I'm going to make that claustrophobic movie be a Western. So I ended up writing uh, a feature version of a short film I'd made called Henry John and the Little Bug. And uh, I turned it into a feature and it had genre elements. So it had violence and, and there were, you know, elements of thriller and it was a Western and there were, there were elements of, of sort of horror in it because of the violence. But at the same time, I wanted to make sure it was really elevated and really dramatic and sort of exploitative in an art house sort of way. Like I really just wanted to make 
my eraser head, like a very bizarre first film. I knew if we were going to make it for, for very little money, I could do uh, almost whatever I wanted to do with it. But I knew with, with the violence, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, with, with the violent elements, that, that it would be easier to sell. I thought it would be easier to sell than my, my drama. And it turned out that it was. I mean, we didn't. We went out with it, and we didn't get ten million dollars to shoot it right away. But we got the first half a million fairly fairly quickly, and that was in large part due to uh, a new pro- another producer we brought on board, uh, Roseanne Korenberg, who is the other key element, the real key element to our team now. And you know, I've known her for many years. I met her when I first came to LA, but. Uh, Roseanne has produced some amazing films. She did Half Nelson with uh, with Ryan Gosling. He got nominated for an Oscar for it. She did Hard Candy with Ellen Page, uh, and she also was the EP of uh, the executive producer of I Tanya came out this year. And, and uh, Margot Robbie was up for an Oscar for that. And Allison Janney won the won the, the supporting actor actress Oscar. So Roseanne has this incredibly storied career um, picking and producing really great uh, independent films. And she has a real creative sens- sensibility, like a, a real um, desire to, to do, to produce great art, not just content. And she was also the, the head of acquisitions at Miramax for, for a number of years. Um, when I first came to LA, I remember watching the, uh, watching the movie Hard Candy, which was a, one of my favorite films back then. And, I watched the special features and they said that the person who had found the money for them and who had, who had put the movie together for them and believed in the film and made it happen was this woman named Roseanne Korenberg. So I had my, my manager find her email and reach out to her. This was way back when I was trying to get another film made that never happened, um, during my short film career. And, and I was able to get a meeting with Roseanne and we became friends, and she became sort of a mentor, and we uh, we stayed in touch for for years. And uh, I think networking and relationships are so important, but the way you go about that networking is really, really is paramount. I wouldn't have ever made a feature film without Roseanne Korenberg. I don't think Chris and I would have gotten the movie made, and we certainly wouldn't have have gotten into Sundance without Roseanne. And it took me, I mean, I developed a relationship with her eight years before she ever produced a movie of mine. And it was because I legitimately respected her work and what she'd done in the industry. And she liked my work and my scripts when I showed them to her. And she was very supportive. And I just, you know, took her out to lunch every few months and and stayed in touch with her. And didn't really ask her for anything. I didn't really want anything from her except wisdom and knowledge. And it was really nice to have a friendship with somebody who was, uh, who was doing such elevated work. That friendship was very genuine. And by the time I wrote Outlaws and Angels, um, we were sitting at lunch and I told her, I have this, I have this Western. I think I can shoot it for a million bucks. Uh, I want to do my first feature. Would you be interested in helping us get this made? She said, I don't really want to produce independent feature films anymore. She was producing a lot of commercials and she was, I think she was just about to start her job at Miramax, but, uh, but she said, I'll, I'll take a read. And and she read it. And a few days later she said, okay, I'm going to make an exception. I'll, I'll, I'll produce your movie. And Chris and I were just elated, uh, because we, we had, you know, such a, such a phenomenal producer come aboard. And, and so we had all the pieces we needed. We had, you know, Roseanne, who was, um, who had the connections and had the clout and was able to raise money and, and was able to, to be there for us to really take us to the next level. And then I wrote the film and I was going to direct it. And then Chris, Chris was going to physically build the bricks of that movie as a producer on set. So we were ready to go. So Roseanne was integral in closing the first part of the financing for the film. We raised half the money first and we had it sort of sitting there. And then we went to another company and asked them to give us money for the movie. And they said they would give us the rest of the money if we got a certain actor from a certain list. That's what a lot of people seem to do here. The actors 
are as hard to get on your first film as the money. Because they want a certain level of actor that they can kind of count on them bringing in a certain number of people to come and see the film. Is that right? Exactly. And it's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's done. It's a little creepy because it makes you wonder how people are going to break, you know, the days when Jack Nicholson got cast in easy rider just because he was interesting or long gone. I guess in a studio film, if the movie's, you know, uh, if it's a superhero movie or a remake or a sequel and everybody knows there's a brand that's going to sell the movie, or if the director is named Martin Scorsese or Terrence Malick or Quentin Tarantino, then I guess those guys, you know, there are a few handful of directors who are so valuable and a handful of of brands as far as... uh, franchises go or, 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 you know, IP that are so valuable that maybe they can take risks on hiring any actor they want and hiring the crea- the best creative choice. It's a dream for all of us to be able to hire the best creative choice for a role because unfortunately, you know, a lot of film financing now is done solely by metrics. So they'll, you know, financiers will go to a sales company and, and they'll ask the sales company for sales estimates based on a certain actor's name. Uh, and so this is really, it's come down, it's, it's like down to a science now. Film investors, and it, it's helpful for them, obviously, um, and it, it helps them hedge their bets. But I just feel like if you, if you make a great film, the film will end up making money, hopefully. And I think you're more likely to make a great film if you're casting the right people for the roles. So the key is to to play within this system as a filmmaker. The secret is not to fight it, but to find people who have the value that satisfy the investors who are also perfect for the roles. <laughs> and so, so that's where, you know, but, but there's a list. It's not like there's only, you know, one or two actors. <clears throat> exactly. They're going to give you a choice of 10 or exactly. Know, so when, people when, or something, when the, when the guys came in with the rest of the money for, Outlaws and Angels, they were sort of, they, they said, they gave us a, a list of maybe 20 people who would satisfy them. So we started making offers. You know, the, the, the casting process is, is hard because when you're making a, a small movie, I mean, this is, like I said, this is where I assumed at some point I would just get a bunch of money for a movie and I would go crack a bottle of champagne and we'd all celebrate. But that was never how it was. We, you know, we got the first half of the money for this film and then we got a commitment for the second half of the money, but we needed to get a certain actor to get that money. So then it was a year of, of making So there were all these little victories along the way, but the entire process to get the movie made took a couple years. And so once it was finally going, uh, it wasn't, it had happened so incrementally that it was just sort of we, I was there, great, but there was never that moment of oh, it finally happened. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden we were there. And with a, with only one million dollars for the film, <clears throat> by the time you take out all the expenses for the physical things like film and and you know the crew and all that, there's not a whole lot of money there to offer the actors. I would think, right? Bingo. I mean, that's what makes it really, really difficult. And of course, I I look forward to the actors are just so dynamic and and they blow my mind at all because I, I was an actor and part of the reason I wanted to get on the other side of the camera is because I looked at what the most talented actors were doing and I knew I could never be that good I mean actors amaze me when you watch these actors work I mean they just they spill their guts out there on the screen and and it's 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 so difficult to do what they do um, effectively and the ones who make it look the easiest are the best at it. And that's the most difficult. And so I have this great respect for, for really strong actors. And I think actors should be paid a lot of money. I think, I think they deserve everything they get when they pull it off. So it was, it's really frustrating when you're making a small movie and, you know, a lot of people go through this, I'm sure. Uh, And people who are doing really great work who would love to pay actors more. I mean, you know, Sean Baker 
made the Florida Project this year, which got Willem Dafoe mm-hmm. an Oscar nomination. But I, I, I mean, I'm not sure, but I think the budget was somewhere around two million for that movie. And uh, you know, I think Willem Dafoe deserves two million dollars himself. So it's just the goal, the 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 challenge when you're making one of these smaller films. It's not the 1970s anymore. Two th- the movie, you know, 2001 and, uh, you know, McCabe and Mrs. Miller by Robert Altman aren't, oh, or maybe that's a bad example, but, but MASH or, or, you know, some, these Altman films and these sort of character-driven uh, experimental movies aren't top 10 in the box office anymore. So we're part of a specialty market. The people who want to make art house films or character-driven films are usually... Uh, success will look like getting on maybe 400 screens or a couple thousand screens and uh, hopefully your actor gets some sort of awards nomination and and you maybe, you know, you make exponentially more than your budget. But, but these movies are never going to be blockbusters, right? They're never going to make the kind of money that Wonder Woman made or or Iron Man or Black Panther or some uh, superhero movie. So when you decide to make these type of these smaller films, uh, there are people who will finance them, but they'll only finance them at a low level because they know that the earning potential um, isn't as high as a more mainstream movie. So if you get a million bucks to make a movie, the challenge is you're going out to actors who are on a list. And the reason those actors are on a list is because they have real sales value. So most of the actors you're offering, say, $50,000 to on your million dollar movie to play the lead are literally used to making 20 times that. (laughs) So so you're really offering them a gesture, but the equivalent of almost nothing compared to what they normally make. So uh, that's why it takes a while to cast your movie when you're making a small movie, because if you could just throw uh, a couple million dollars at an actor, they'd probably say yes. But when you have a cool little script and you're offering 50 grand or, or 15 grand, <laughs> you're offering them scale or, uh, you know, for a month's worth, worth of work when they're used to making a few million or half a million, um, then you've got to a – lot, a lot of actors, and for good reason, don't have time to even read it, um, so you won't hear back from them. Uh, but and the actors who do, you know, have to decide whether they want to leave their families for a month and really get into this role and put in all this effort for, uh, you know, an amount of money that in the end might end up costing them. So, you know, the the good news about the whole thing is that when you're when you when you don't have the money to pay people what they're worth, the people you end up working with are people who are there for the right reasons. Um, they're definitely not there for the for the payday. So everybody, so are they there because they? What's the driving fact? They like the script, or they like you, or they like I don't know. What, what is it that that makes them make that decision and say yes? I think it's a little bit of of everything. Uh, you know, they read the script before they even meet the director because you send an offer to their agent, and then their agent passes it on and in. In a perfect world, in a perfect scenario, you get the support of their agent because hopefully the agent likes the script and then the agent will be supportive. The agent doesn't like the script and you're in serious trouble because most most people have agents who they listen to. I mean, I listen to my agent because that's why I chose that agent because I trust the yeah, agent. You trust so, them, so, you know, you want to get the agent on board. And if you do, they'll send it to the actor and you'll give them two weeks to respond if they respond, if they resp- the first thing you have to make sure they do is respond to the script. So if they like the script, they will call their agent back and say, I want to meet with the director. And then I'll get a chance to get in the room with the actor. I love meeting with the actors because I know that if I meet with an actor, I have a really, really good chance of them doing the film uh, because I, I'm very, very genuine. And I'm, this is my religion. I love filmmaking so much. And I'm so passionate about what I do, that usually I know that if they like the script already, and the last thing they have to decide is whether they want to work 
within my vision on the project, I think I usually have a good chance of getting them to do it in the room. And it's because I, I really do want to collaborate with the actor and involve them in the creative process. And I really care about what I'm doing. I've had great meetings with actors. And so I think at first, you know, part of their decision making is the script. Part of their decision making definitely is is the director, whether they want to work with you based on either your previous work or how much you guys get along in the meeting. And then there's the money that factors in. But, you know, I learned a valuable lesson on Outlaws and Angels and I don't I do not want to underpay people. I can't wait to pay I can't wait to be able to pay people, you know, more than they're worth. But on Outlaws and Angels, the the the, the actors we ended up with, I mean, on a million dollar movie, our cast was exponentially bigger than a million dollar movie. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was really, we were really out of our league with cast. I can't believe we got who we got. I mean, Chad Michael Murray, um, who's, you know, the star of One Tree Hill for years and, uh, and has done countless huge motion pictures that have made a, a ton of money. And, and he's just very, very popular. And, and so we got him to, to be the lead. Francesca Eastwood, who's Clint Eastwood's daughter and up and coming and has done so many great films. Also the daughter of Frances Fisher. Uh, she has, you know, two incredible movie star parents and, and she inherited all their talent. She's amazing. Uh, and then we got Terry Polo uh, and, uh, and, and Frances Fisher came and did a, a small role and Luke Wilson was in the movie. Uh, ben Browder, uh, Keith Lonaker. I mean, it was just... Madison Beatty. Uh, we we got everybody in our film had done movies that were much bigger than the movie we were doing, and they all had quotes <laughs> that were much higher than what we had. But everybody who came in to the film, it was such a, an amazing experience because every actor who came to do the movie was doing it not at all because of the money. They were doing the movie because they felt they loved the script. And they felt that it was going to give them an opportunity to do something they hadn't done before. So the level of commitment we got from the actors, I mean, Chad, Chad Michael Murray flew to New York and trained with a guy named Larry Moss, a world-renowned acting coach, for months before the movie shot because he just wanted to be fully prepared for the role. And we had a bunch of meetings and talked about his dialect and what he was going to do, but uh, he went on his own dime and trained for the role before he came out and did it. There wasn't anybody who showed up on set without knowing their lines, and that that happens even with big actors. There wasn't anybody who showed up on set who showed up late or showed up drunk or you know who who wasn't taking it seriously. Everybody on that movie was taking it seriously, and these are people who, you know, have been in movies like Meet the who have starred in movies like Meet the Parents and The Master and you know Old School and uh, you know all these big studio films that have made lots of money and they're out here in New Mexico doing this million dollar you know aspiring Sundance movie with a first time director and they were all just a dream to work with to to an extent where we want to keep this crew together in many ways, you know, even if, uh, even if on my new film, maybe the leads are in a different age range than the leads on my last film, we still want that group to come back and, and, and play supporting roles if they're willing. Uh, because I just believe in, in sort of keeping a company together and working with people you're familiar with. Well, I do notice that, uh, when I watch, I personally, I like films, but anymore, I really like series. Yeah. There's some really good there's TV. Some great series out there. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be watching something, and I'll go, oh, that actor was in this, and then next thing I'll go, hey, three of the actors in this were in another series that I just watched. Yeah, and so I can tell either the producer or the director. And a lot of times, has, if a, you has back, a team. Yeah, the producer and, and, will be and the and same. And they will try to put them in in all their films. And yep. So I do see that. Yeah, it it you know if you watch uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's films, for instance, Boogie Nights. Magnolia was his second, or Boogie Nights was his second film. Magnolia was his third film. Then he made Punch Drunk Love and There Will Be Blood and and uh, and now The Phantom Thread. You know he's made so many great films, but his first three movies. I mean, you'd, you'd see Julianne Moore and John C. Riley and all these people coming back, uh, and 
now he's done he's done two films with with um, Daniel Day Lewis. I think when you work with somebody who is a pleasure to work with and is easy to work with, and who becomes your friend and who also gives it their all, and on top of all of that, their all is plenty. They happen to be very very talented. Also, that combination of things. I mean, it's like finding a wife. Uh, or, or a husband, or somebody to share your life with. I mean, you know, I I didn't think I would ever get married, but I met somebody who had all these elements that came together that I never thought I'd find in one person, and I knew I couldn't not marry her. You know, so uh, that's the same way you feel about. It's like a unicorn when you find an actor who has all these elements. They're good people. They're easy to work with. They try their hardest and they're incredibly talented. It's really hard to find all that. Sometimes really talented people are, are, are not nice people. And sometimes really nice people who work really hard aren't very talented. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I mean, Chad Michael Murray blew my mind because this guy was a known heartthrob like a teen heartthrob and, and his, his, his demographic wasn't exactly the demographic I was going for with the film. Cause, cause Outlaws and Angels is a very, you know, it's sort of a Martin Scorsese, an early Martin Scorsese movie in the old West. I mean, it's, it's ultra violent. It's, it's edgy. It's, you know, and, and he'd, he'd been in a lot of romantic comedies and, and, and on a, on a, on a show where he was the romantic lead. And I didn't know what to expect from him. Uh, and he showed up transformed and, you know, he's also become one of my closest friends, but the guy is a, is a great talent and he's so easy to work with. And if I could find a reason for him to be the star of everything I ever do, it would be, it, it would be, you know, I, I'd, I'd have a happy career, but the same goes for pretty much everybody on that set. And, and I, I had, I remember Ben Browder who, who was, he played the father in the movie, totally changed his appearance too. He was the star of a show called Farscape, which has a huge cult following. It's, it's one of the most popular sci-fi shows of all time. But, you know, he's been in a thousand movies and, and was the star, you know, was an action star. And he came out and, and uh, gained a little weight and we shaved the top of his head to make it look like he was bald and he had hair on the sides and put a mustache on him and he just transformed for this movie and didn't care about looking, being, you know, the handsome guy anymore. And I remember during the last day of shooting, he looked at me and said, JT, how many of these do you think you'll make in your life? And I said, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'll be insanely prolific. I don't want to wait 10 years between movies, but I'd like to maybe make a movie every two or three years and make it really, really good. You know, so I said, I don't know, maybe I'll make 10 movies. Maybe I'll make 15 if I'm really lucky. And he said, okay, let's say you make 10 movies. He said, look around right now and, and, and really soak this in because he said, I've been, I've been, I mean, he's been doing this for, I don't know, maybe 30 years. And, and he said, it's really rare. A, a team, a cast and a crew congeal like they have here. Um, you're not going to have this again," <laughs> he said. "There will be there will be one loose cannon, or there will be there will be somebody who's difficult, or you know, th- there will be sets where everybody's difficult." But he said, "This is just a, a really magical set with a really magical cast, and I can't help but think that a lot of that. Not only did I genuinely like all the people I was working with for different reasons, and I tried to. I think a, a director needs to be able to. Not only do you need to be able to author shots and know what kind of lens to use, and and you know decide what the color palette is, and and you know direct your department heads well, but aside from the technical, I think a good director needs to really know, needs to be sort of a, a, a psychologist at times. Like you need to be able to really read people and figure out what the challenges are going to be with them or what what their shortcomings are going to be or what their weaknesses are going to be. And you've got to identify what those are and then figure out how to make them the most comfortable and, and just really help their strengths flourish and, and, and get their insecurities out of the way. And I think that if you if you find a way to interact and connect with each person – each actor who's on set and each actor is going to need to be interacted with in a different way and different things are going to be effective with them. But 
if you can read them well and you really listen to them and you really try to understand them and you don't just look at them as a set piece or something, you you look at them as a human being and an extremely talented human being and, and literally the most important part of your movie because without good actors, you've got nothing. So it, if you really just try and figure out who they are and really listen to them and identify what the best strategy is going to be to make them the most comfortable on set, then I think you'll have a, a successful run and people will be happy. So I feel like I'm good at that. Uh, I, sometimes I failed, but I, I did my best. But I can't help but think that part of the reason we had such an amazing group of people with such great attitudes on our set is because we asked them all to work for almost nothing. Mm-hmm. It's unfortunate because I, I don't want to I don't want to always pay people absolutely not I mean I'm, I'm I'm hoping I can get people to act the same way who are making gazillions of dollars because that's what they deserve but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that everybody who ended up on our movie had to do it for so little that they had to be there for the right reasons you know well there was a, a definitely a reward in now I don't know how important it was to the actors but I know this film your first film, made it into the Sundance Film Festival, yes. which is a big thing. Very big. And it was, um, it was a big honor. Was that important to the actors? Absolutely. You know, in every single um, independent film, when you're giving your first address, when you're, when you're making a speech to the cast and the crew, if that's what you do as a director, but there's usually some sort of meeting or maybe the, the director addresses the crew – or when, or even earlier in the in the very genesis of the film or or the or the, the development of the actual movie as a production when you're meeting with actors maybe your first meetings with actors in the very beginning stages of a movie you're always saying to get people excited on every independent film out there i'm sure they're saying the same thing they're always saying well we hope to get into sundance or we hope to get into can but as domestically, it's pretty much there's some great festivals in the U.S. You know, there's, um, I mean, there's some amazing, amazing festivals, and there's other places I'd love. There's South by Southwest, and there's some great stuff up in Canada. There's Toronto, and and there's there's amazing film festivals. But I still feel like even with the advent of all these other really cool festivals, that there's something so prestigious about Sundance. There's something it just it just resonates with people. It's a legendary festival. It, it, so many of the best films have premiered there. So within our industry, it's sort of the holy grail of domestic film festivals. And if your movie goes to Sundance, it instantly gives it more legs, and or it instantly gives it legs. <laughs> and uh, and so it's always the dream to go to Sundance. Just like with every short film I made, you talk about Sundance, but you never get in. So. At the beginning of, of our film, of course, we would talk to actors and cast and crew and say, listen, we want to make this a great movie. We want this to be a Sundance movie. But you, you hear that said on every independent film set, and uh, it's highly unlikely that a lot of great films do not get into Sundance. You can just go and premiere somewhere else. So I honestly didn't think we were going to get into Sundance. I didn't expect to. It was a very specific sort of picture. And it's very provocative, and it's very violent, and there's, you know, sexual elements that I hadn't ever seen explored in a Western before, and taboos that I wanted to to explore here. And I wasn't sure if it was the type, I didn't know where it would go. And um, I'd say probably the most exciting and sort of the closest in my career, the closest moment to that I've made it sort of thing that we were talking about before. The closest I've had to that is the night that I heard we got into the Sundance Film Festival because I wasn't expecting it. I didn't really care anymore. I mean, I'd, I'd stopped allowing myself to care about getting into Sundance because I thought it would, it would be, it would be difficult. And uh, we finished shooting the movie at, we, we shot the movie in three weeks, which is an insane shooting schedule. It was three, six day weeks. So we shot it in 18 days and we, we went back and we started doing a rough assembly with my editor, Chris Bell, 
you know, we were, we hadn't even done color. I mean, my Matthew Irving, my cinematographer and I were supposed to go in and do color and do all this stuff. And, and we, we just had a rough assembly that was a half an hour longer than the final movie was going to end up being. And the Sundance deadline was approaching. So we submitted it and I figured a hundred percent we weren't getting in because this was a rough cut with no sound mix or no, like nothing was, nothing was ready. So we just submitted to Sundance because we knew that actors, investors, everybody who'd, who'd done hard work on the movie who hadn't made a lot of money, I figured we owed it to them to at least submit to Sundance. Now, did they, when you submitted it, did you submit it and tell them? Is it like a, a disclaimer on there that it wasn't finished? Absolutely, absolutely. So there are a lot of movies that are submitted unfinished. I'm assuming that most of the movies that get in that are submitted unfinished are movies by, you know, tested directors who have either played there before or or maybe they have a huge movie star in them and it's a very buzzed about film that they want to get the premiere of and they know it's going to turn out. I don't I don't know. I'm I'm this is all sort of uh you know, guesswork, but I I think I think it's it's not common that movies get in that aren't finished. Obviously you have a a better shot. A first impression's a first impression. So when you send it to them, you say this is a rough cut. This movie still has work to be done. Color isn't done. Sound isn't done. And but it's so competitive anyway that I just assumed unless we send our very very best version, we don't have a chance in hell. So we did submit, and after we submitted the film, Roseanne had had a few movies at Sundance, so she of course called the festival and said, uh, you know, I'm really proud of this film. We have this movie. And, and, but a lot of people think it's, it's all about politics getting into these film festivals and they have a lot of integrity at Sundance. They're very picky. I know people who've, who've been there three times with movies who didn't get accepted a certain year because they didn't think it was up to their standards. So, um, when it really comes down to it, you, the programmers really have to like your movie and think it fits into that. And and if there were four other Westerns being submitted, we might not have gotten in that year. But I do know that we submitted the film. I kind of put it to the back of my mind, just kept cutting the movie. I figured we'd either premiere it another festival later in the year, or maybe we'd just sell directly to a distributor and, and get released. But I, I just wanted to focus on making the movie. And, uh, and a couple of weeks later, my producing partner, Chris, uh, asked me to meet him at a restaurant. And I show up and, and he says, we got into Sundance. It was, it was the, it was t- at that point, it was definitely the best moment, um, of my career. So yeah, far, it was so exciting. I mean, it was like, we've arrived, you know, we got, we got into Sundance. This is, this has been the dream for like a decade to get, to get a movie into Sundance. So it was pretty cool. So you get into Sundance and then you had a. Big film company pick it up, right? And yeah, yeah, it, was, it, it was, got into the theaters. It was great. Uh, listen, to, you know, I think part of the reason we got into Sundance, and they won't admit this to me. I'm just, I just think so. I think there's a good chance that we got into Sun. Part of the reason we got in was because we shot on Kodak motion picture film. Very few low budget indies are shooting on film these days. Now, there's been a big resurgence in the last couple of years, but I'm such a purist, and we always find a way to do it, and. There are so many other movies that were shot on for a million bucks at Sundance that weren't shot on film. When you submit a movie on film, it sets it apart. It looks better. It looks richer. It has more texture. It it just it, it looks like film. And and you can't fake that, right? You can't. You can't. I mean, there's some there's some really great digital video cameras that are, that are around now, and I won't deny that they look better than video has ever looked. But the goal of those cameras is still to replicate the look of film. Nothing's been able to do it. Uh, so if you really want the look of film, you have to shoot film. And Kodak was really, really gracious. They offered to pay to create a film print. So we didn't just shoot on film and go to Sundance and project digitally. We actually, which would have been fine because we still shot on film, but we went to Sundance and we actually premiered on a film print. So there was a lot of buzz at the festival about about our format, which was great. And so we went to Sundance. We had the first, uh, we had our premiere. It was sold out. It was, it was a blast. All the, all the screenings were sold out. There were five screenings at Sundance. I went to most of them 
and did a Q and A after. And the crowds at Sundance were really great with us. They loved the film. The first review from a major critic was from Dennis Harvey at Variety, and that came out um, right after our premiere, and it was stellar. So that was a really, really exciting time, too, uh, when we got our first uh, review from a critic who I appreciated and admired, uh, and it was a really good one. Uh, and then we had those sold-out crowds at Sundance. It was a magical week. Of course, of course, we also sold the movie to E1 and Momentum, and uh, they actually co they they released the film in theaters with the help of MGM under the uh Orion uh label which mm-hmm. under the Orion uh logo which um Orion hadn't had a movie but you know MGM hadn't used uh, Orion to release a film uh, I don't think before ours for about 20 years I mean they they were a big company releasing movies back in the 80s and 90s but I think we were the first in a long time to, with the Orion logo on the on the opening credits of the movie, but yeah, we we were released in uh, fifteen or twenty cities, small art house theatrical, but we got into theaters, which was nice, and then went to VOD and 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 you know to the Walmart and Target shelves and, and everywhere. And but it, and it went on. Uh, was it Netflix or Amazon? I can't remember. I think it was Amazon, right? Yeah, it's it's uh, Amazon Prime. It's streaming there now for free. Every place you can stream something it's available itunes hulu uh everywhere uh except netflix it usually these usually land at netflix last so mm. um it was in red box for a long time i think it still is uh but well like much. i i told you i, I saw the movie twice thank I, you i, I really liked it <laughs> and, and i thought it was great if you don't mind i we talked about this a little bit before we started but you know there was another movie that came out that was also a western at the same time the hateful eight that yeah. I think you got a little accused. Now, to me, I, I watched both of those movies. I thought your movie was superior. But I think you got accused of, of copying or, or stealing the idea or something. But And you told me about it. So tell the audience. So let, let's give you a chance to defend yourself a little <laughs> bit here. Thanks. Well, we, you know, like I said, at Sundance, we had our first couple reviews come out, and they were really amazing. But then I got a large dose of, of, you know, I got really beat up by some critics and people who saw it. And that was a good experience for me, probably. I got thicker skin now. And and we made a movie that was not meant to please everybody. So it was a very, very controversial movie and a controversial release. And um, people either loved it or hated it. And it was very, very mixed. And it got people talking on both sides, which was always the intention. I think it was unfortunate that I have the utmost respect for Quentin Tarantino. I mean, the guy is a a brilliant film director. Um, He has a great film knowledge, and he's made some timeless classic films. I think it was really unfortunate for us as a little movie that his film came out pretty much, I think it came out the same month. Um, that we came out. And to tell you the truth, people who like cinema and really know film can sort of see how fundamentally different our two movies are. The storylines are are very different. The themes are totally different. And the way the, the, the characters are extremely different. The style of the movie making, you know, Tarantino's an amazing director, but, you know, that was a I think a $90 million movie or something and ours was a million bucks. And, and so we, we shot it in a totally different way and, and we played up the grain and, and used a lot of zoom lens and, and it was just a more, ours was a more dirty sort of gritty little piece and his was much more polished and it's just a whole different movie and well, should really be judged only... and, and, and should be judged differently. But I, I think that the reason a few, uh, a few critics and a few people came, came out, they were looking at, superficially they were looking at the similarities were which were obviously they got released at the same time uh, they were both about a group of people in one small room for most of the movie yeah that and was so the yeah. extent of the similarity yeah. that's what i saw yeah uh, yeah it's it's a western yeah and it's shot in one place and it's a group of bad guys and you know, yeah, and a family, and but other than that, there really wasn't that much else that was similar. No, I think it was. I think it's really a lot different and uh, very different. And I thought there would there was room for both of us. And obviously, you know, Hateful Eight did fine, but I just I think that it would have been 
it would have been really nice if the film had been gestating for five years or something. I mean, I wrote the script in 2011. We didn't shoot it till 2016. So it was, or 2015. So it was, it took a while and it would have been so nice if Outlaws had come out even a year before Hateful Eight, because I think then it, it just would have been looked at a little differently. Unfortunately, we were always a little bit in the shadow of that film most of the critics, for good reason, mentioned Hateful Eight because it had come out maybe a few weeks before ours. And most of the critics would mention it. And obviously, you know, we were at a little bit of a budgetary disadvantage to that movie. Uh, but and it's and it's Quentin Tarantino. The guy's a legend. So uh, you, it was you couldn't it, it would have been impossible for you to copy anything. Absolutely. Impossible. Now, most it, you're most working on this movie for years, you you. you there's there's no way that you could have copied no, no. even anything about not that even remotely. Movie. I mean, most of the listen. I even know Shannon McIntosh, who's who's uh, Quentin's producer, and I know a lot of people in Quentin's circle who have seen the movie, and, and nobody's ever accused me of that because they know better. Um, it, there were a couple critics who wrote in their reviews that it was a hateful eight ripoff and that definitely bothered me i mean i can handle it's bad reviews yeah. i can handle bad reviews because everybody has a right to their own opinion and art is very subject- subjective but uh but when I, those couple that said I, I i could have ripped off the movie definitely got under my skin and i try not to let reviews get under my skin but i got really upset because it's physically impossible if our movies came out at the same time that means we were shooting at the same time which means that, you know, I assume I wrote my screenplay either at the same time or before Quentin wrote Hateful Eight. And uh, it was just one of those things where we both happened to be doing something at the same time. And, 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 and we both wanted to make a Western that was sort of structured the same at the same time. It's uh, kind of weird that that, that would happen. It's, it's just, just by chance that that would happen. But I remember another couple movies that came out... Um, or maybe it was about 10 years ago, there was two movies, space movies, where there was an asteroid going to come and hit the Earth. And there was two completely different movies that had the same story. I remember that. You yeah, remember that was, those? Yeah, that was one was called the name Deep of, Impact, and yeah, the other Deep one was Impact. called Armageddon. Yeah. I think they were both at the same time. Very yeah. similar movies. They both came out like within, I don't know, a month or so. Of yeah. Them. And the story was almost the same. Same thing with Valma and, and Dangerous Liaisons years ago. They were they were like the same story. That happens sometimes, you know. I mean, I, I remember being a little bit terrified because I thought that even though we were making a really tiny movie on a really low budget, I hadn't really seen a Western, except for maybe The Proposition, that was a great film that influenced... It was an Australian movie with Guy Pearce, but uh, it wasn't technically a western because it wasn't in the old american west but i hadn't really seen many westerns that had taken the violence and the ethical ambiguity and the sexual elements and all that further than say sam peckinpah had in the in the late 70s and i hadn't seen that next step really i hadn't seen that real envelope pushing western yet Mm -hmm. uh i'd seen some that had gotten close but i thought the envelope could be busted wide open and even though we were making this really tiny movie that it might have a great you know global impact or at least nationwide impact uh just because of of the noise we were going to make with with the subject matter right right? so I, i thought it did have the ability to end up really huge even bigger than it that it ended up and um and I remember when I wrote the script in 2011 and I was shopping it around and, and we were finally in the casting phase and I knew we were going to shoot in a few months. I remember reading, uh, there was a press release about Hateful Eight. And I remember reading and being like, oh, this is cool. Tarantino's got a new movie. I wonder what it's about. And then I read the synopsis and it said, you know, eight people or, you know, get trapped in a, during a snowstorm in a cabin and it's a Western. And my... I mean, my my heart sank. I remember calling my producers and saying, "Is this is this really happening? Like, is this is he making a western about a bunch of people trapped <laughs> uh-huh, in one uh-huh. location?" And and uh, and then you know, once we got closer to production, we 
we saw a, a few more details about, you know, some stuff had leaked about what his film was about. And I thought that audiences would be able to differentiate because, that, like I said, even though there's some similarities structurally, the style's totally different and the themes are totally different. Uh, it's just a very, very different story. But but yeah, there was no escaping that. So we just kind of had to embrace yeah. it. And then I thought, well, listen, you know, Quentin Tarantino, his movies do so well. Uh, perhaps Hateful Eight coming out and getting people's minds back on Westerns, uh, if it did well, would actually help us. So, you know, you can't really, can't get too upset. You just make what you make and and, and you hope nobody comes out with a similar film at the same time. But, yeah. <laughs> so... That takes us up through the present. Uh, tell me what's your next big plan. I'm in development right now on a number of, of films. Uh, I, I like to I like to write my own my own films, uh, but I'm also open to directing something that somebody else has written if it fits my sensibilities as a director. It's been about a year and a half since my movie came out in theaters, so it's about time to shoot something new. I'm really looking forward to to my next movie, but I've been really careful. You know, I have great agents and a great manager and and a great attorney who all, you know, help me decide what to do next and and what to look at. I've been offered some films that are more, that are similar to to the movie I already made, that are ultra-violent movies, uh, that are genre films. I've been offered some horror films. And and so I, I could have gotten to work a little quicker on a, on a second movie, but looking at the history of cinema and how much, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen so many films and I've been studying cinema and studying my favorite directors for so many years that I know what people's career trajectories look like and how they can turn out. And one thing I've noticed is the sophomore film, the second movie, the second feature film by most directors is, uh, is frequently the most impactful and the most important as far as their long-term canon and mm-hmm. their career and, and what sort of art they make as they move forward. So maybe five movies down the road, I could, I could just decide to make a movie that sounds fun and give it a try. And if, if it, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I know for a fact that my second movie is, is the probably the most important decision I'll ever make as a filmmaker. Uh, and it needs to be great and it needs to be um, special, and it needs to show. For me, I, I need it to show range. I I, I don't want to just make uh, violent films are great. I, so many of them have influenced me. You know, Goodfellas, Mean Streets. Like, I, I love violent movies, but I also love uh, movies like Cries and Whispers, and you know, Days of Heaven, and and th- I want to make sure that I I can make character driven dramas as well. So. Um, so I've 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 pushed really hard to make sure my second film is has a different sensibility, and uh, right now we are in the casting phase on a movie that I've been I, I've been attached to two films that other people wrote that I really believe in. They both have a different sort of plan and schedule. They're both financed, but planning on shooting at different times in the next two years. Uh, neither of those movies have been announced, so I can't say what they are. Uh, but they're really special projects with people I really admire. One of them was a script written by a guy named Richard Bato, who um, he goes by RB. He's a friend of mine, and he wrote this really excellent script that just got financing and just got sold to a company, and they just got brought me on to, to be their director. So hopefully that movie will go soon. Um, and I also wrote a movie called 18 Wheels and a Dozen Roses. Uh, It's actually, it's been through many rewrites, but it's the movie that I was trying to get made before I made Outlaws and Angels that I was having difficulty with because I hadn't made a movie yet. It's a, it's a drama. The film comparables are, I guess they'd be, you know, Leaving Las Vegas meets Crazy Heart. Uh, It's a West Texas romance about a trucker and uh, a recovering alcoholic trucker and uh, and a drug addicted sex worker, and they fall in love and all the finest people. He t- yes, yes, <laughs> yes, right, right, right there. Very positive. Uh, no, he, uh, you know, it's it's a love story. He t- he tries to clean her up and um, and help her out. We got to see where that goes. Yeah, but, uh, I don't want to give it away. No, no, but it's uh, 
yeah, it's supposed to – that movie is is also ready to go. And we're just – you know, with with all these three projects that I'm I'm really focused on right now, we're just trying to figure out who our leads are going to be and w- when we're going to shoot. So I think I'm going to have some back-to-back coming up pretty soon. But the project that's supposed to go first uh, is, is right now set to start in June, but that could change. That's great. So you can just tell everybody then it's really easy to become a director, right? It's very. <laughs> you just, you it's just, so easy. You yeah, just it's... decide you want to be a director, and next thing you know, you're a director. Now, man, you know, out of my podcasts and and out of my career, you know, all my all my stuff has been in the music business. But there's a lot of similarities. There are really are a lot of similarities in, in in what happens in your business and what happens in in my business. I believe uh, it. It's tough. It's not easy. I congratulate you on hanging in there because a lot of it is just that, you know, not giving up. Just keep going. I mean, and you've done that. A lot of people would have given up a long time ago. Yeah, well, I think uh, you probably have that similar sort of attrition, I guess, or or just, uh, just keeping with it. And I don't think it's about you know, not giving up. I, I, well, obviously that's what it's about, but I, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's because of any, any, uh, I didn't decide to be, to be, I'm never going to quit. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that type of thing. It was, it was basically, I found this thing that I love to do so much and I just can't, it's fundamentally part of who I am now. Well, yeah, it's, it's who the... I, it's what I identify with and I can't imagine life without making movies. So it's sort of like imagining life, um, you can get through life without your left hand, but you'd rather not. So, so you just, you, you gotta go through it with the left hand. Like, I feel like it's part of me. I feel like it's really part of me and cinema is part of me. And, uh, and there's really, there was no other choice for me. I just, I just had to keep plugging away and, and, and so it, it was never an option. It was always just like, when am I going to be shooting my feature? Not if. Uh, and I never set a timeline on it. I remember saying once, it's really funny looking back on it. I remember in, when I first got to LA saying to some friends, some friends, I came, I came out, I moved out here from Vegas with like 10 other people who all wanted to be in the film industry. They're all gone now. I mean, I think there may be one guy still floating around, but most of them all left after two years or something. And I remember looking at a few of the people I came out here with, and I was in it for the long haul. I was moving here to become a filmmaker and stay in LA. And a couple of the people I came with said, uh, I'm going to give it two years. or I'm going to give it three years, and then I'll go back. So it was like this attempt they were making at something. It wasn't a real commitment. It wasn't a life choice. And I remember looking at, at, at a couple of those friends and saying, I don't care how long it takes. Like, I'm here. Like, this is what I'm going to do for a living. And and I don't care if it takes 10 years. I remember thinking 10 years sounded so far off. (laughs) And I went into production on my first feature film exactly 10 years after, 10 years and two months after I'd moved to LA. Good thing you didn't make it a three year deal. Good thing I didn't make it a three year deal. Yeah, Yeah. you never never made that film. And in that ten years, it went by very fast. Yeah, by the way, which is is frightening. Life goes. I mean, that's a whole other story. Fast. Yeah. Well, that's the similarity. Is like musicians, uh, guys that are really committed. They look. They'll go out and play clubs for fifty bucks a, a night to just play. Yeah. And you know, and you know, that's not enough money for an evening of of playing. No. All the work no. that they've done, but they do it. Because because they're committed to it, and that's that's what you've done, and that's I think that that's what it takes in the arts. I mean, totally. you know, of course, there's lucky some people who get lucky, and you know, they have a big hit, yeah, right, right away, right, right, right away, away yeah. out of the box. But but that's that's really rare. I that think if it happened that way, I would have I would have turned into a total asshole. Uh, I don't know if I was allowed to say that on your of podcast. course you can. <laughs> um, but but I think if if it would have happened that fast. I think it would have been really bad for me, actually. It would have been easier, but uh, I don't think I would have had the same respect and and uh, as I do for the industry and just working in it. I feel so grateful every time I'm on set. Every time I get hired, I mean, I do. I just got hired to to adapt a novel into a screenplay, and I feel so grateful to be doing this work that's within the industry. And it took me a long time to start working within it, but you know, I think I was also really lucky, and I didn't really mention this before, but I was. I was really lucky, and not everybody has this, and maybe it lights a fire under their ass if they don't, but I was really lucky to have incredibly 
supportive people around me. My yeah. parents were always, I mean, you know, like I said, my mom, Jenny Molnar, was a singer, and my dad, Duke, was an, and he still acts in my movie. He's in Outlaws and Angels. He plays the sheriff in the yeah. opening, in the opening uh, uh, scene, but my mom's done songs for movies I've made, and, 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 and she'll probably do one for, for 18 Wheels, but my parents, who were strict just like any other parents when I was growing up, were always, though, I, w- I didn't realize till I got to be an adult how lucky I was. Every time I said, I want to do this instead of this, you know, uh, I, I want to be an actor or I want to be a writer or I want to be a filmmaker. Every time I made one of those decisions, uh, they were right on board with it as long as I wanted to do it. It was never, oh, maybe you should be a dentist instead. Or, and I'm about to go to the dentist, so hopefully, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. but uh, maybe you want to be a, a you know a, an accountant instead because it's and there's nothing wrong with any of those jobs. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. I yeah. always wanted to be an artist, and they were always supportive of the arts. And there were times when, you know, I fell flat on my face and lost every job I had and needed to borrow money, and and I was able to borrow money, which from them, which which was was very helpful. Um, I was always able to support myself, but I did have family members who. If everything fell apart, uh, you know, would send me a check for rent and then I'd pay them back. But um, some people don't have any of that. So yeah. there's even an extra layer. I mean, I had a little bit of a safety net because I had so many. And it wasn't just my parents. Everybody around me um, in my life, aunts, uncles, you know, my now my wife, my brother, my friends. I just always had really uh, people who really believed in me and who were really supportive around me the people I picked in my life as friends and the family. And that really helped. That really helped because I didn't have detractors. I didn't tell, I I had people in town telling me to quit because I sucked when I'd go to meetings, but nobody who was close with me was ever trying to Mm -hmm. discourage me. And I have other friends who have told me that they've gone through exactly the opposite where the people around them are constantly trying to discourage them from doing what they love. And that's got to be difficult. Um, Yeah. I feel well, very, very that's grateful. And what you said about, um, you know, uh, it helped because, like, child actors. You see, if you look at the list of child actors that were really successful in their children, a lot of them turned out, you know, have disastrous lives. Yeah, disastrous. because because they didn't have to go through the learning process and the the fighting to to get where they were. Yeah, but anyway. Um, I think uh, you need to go to the dentist. Yeah, I think I probably took up too much and of your we've time. Got a lot of, I didn't, I didn't think I had so much to here. say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's okay. It's all good. So um, thank you, J.T. Molnar. And we'll be looking forward to your next film. And I hope it's a big success. And then maybe you could come back and talk yeah, maybe, to me again after that. Yeah, or maybe right before it. So or we right get a before bunch it. Of sure, we'll get, we'll get you some press. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so right. much for having me, Ross. It was a, it was a pleasure. Sure, JT. All right, we'll sign it off. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye-bye. The Ross Around Backstage Podcast wants to thank my good friend, Tim Hines, for the original music that you are listening to now. We are currently looking for sponsors for the Ross Around Backstage Podcast so that we can continue to bring you interesting stories like the one you just heard. I can be reached through Facebook or email me at rosspalone.com. Thank you for listening.